Hi everybody. Um, you may be able to hear the birds outside uh, my window. They're very noisy in our garden. When I said yes to giving this talk, um, what, what, I, what went through my mind was, oh no, I've got enough going on. I'm teaching a qualification. I've got a big course coming up. I don't want to do anything else. And then I went, oh, I know what I can do. I can give the talk I just gave for the Flinthorn community, the Finthorn Foundation community, on healing and angels, and so I don't have to put in any extra work. And um, any of you who are teachers or writers or creatives or people who design things, gardens, whatever it is, you, you'll know that there's a period of time where you're not thinking about it, and then as you come up to when you have to do the work, you start having ideas. And as I started coming towards giving this um, presentation, I found that my mind and my psyche and my awareness was going in a very different direction from the talk I gave for the Fintorn people. And what I found myself doing was going, I think what I want to do is share with you my personal model of what I think happens in healing. And it's not the healing trust model in particular. Um, it's, it's my model and it's, and it's a model I've developed for my own personal understanding over the decades. And I think partly me thinking about doing this new presentation was because I knew I'd be talking with other healers. I wasn't going to be talking with a group of folk that are new to healing. If you are completely new to healing, then you're jumping in the deep end here. Um, for those of you who are familiar with healing, I'm going to give, I hope that if I give you my um, take on it, what's going on, that um, you'll find it, um, you may not agree with it, but you'll hope, I hope you'll find it a kind of slightly interesting, stimulating take on things which you can bounce off and will help maybe clarify your own thinking and practice. And to a degree, this is me thinking out loud. I'm, I'm still working it out. So please don't take what I'm about to share with you as kind of concrete. This is it, it's engraved in stone. And um, if you're gonna have a chat with me, this is what you have to believe because that's not the case. Um, so just a tiny bit of information about my personal background with healing. Um, as some of you know, um, I think, my dad was a um, medical doctor, a psychiatrist. Uh, my mum was a psychologist and journalist, and they were absolutely hostile to anything that was metaphysical or spiritual or to do with energies and all that kind of thing. They absolutely associated it with um, con artists of one kind or another. Um, nevertheless, even though I was brought up in that uh, context, nevertheless, quite early on, I had a very clear sense of atmospheres, energies, and I could feel whether something was basically good or not good, which I, th I think if anybody's going into training in, in, in metaphysics or psychics, like your very first lesson should be, can you discern between that which is good and that which is bad? Can you discern between that which is positive, good energy, love, and that which is negative and destructive? And I think I, very early on, I had a kind of radar that could pick that up. And very early on, I found myself um, instinctively playing with creating atmospheres, shifting atmospheres, that I could, in a room with a group of friends, kind of slightly direct the conversation and the atmosphere so that it became a spooky if you were telling a spooky ghost story or happy if you were telling a happy story. And I realized that it wasn't just simply the story, it was actually also how you told the story that influenced it. Storytellers don't just tell stories. They have a, uh, for want of a better word, a, a charisma or a radiation that goes with the story that, that takes you into the feelings of the story. If you listen to a good fairy tale, or a good prayer. The uh, celebrant, the priestess, the storyteller is taking you into the vibe. And I realized I had that as, um, as something I could do and was interested in. And my mum 
for all her um, deep scepticism about anything to do with the healing arts, um, quite early on she, she asked me to touch her, give her foot massage, give her shoulder massage, and she felt <clears throat> something useful was happening there. I never personally had a calling to train as a healer. Um, but inside my family situation, there have been times, um, especially when family members have been experiencing inflammation in various parts of the body, where I've known instinctively I could help soothe it and um, help things fix. So, and um, family members generally know that occasionally it's useful to ask me to come and give a hand. And because of close family members who've done trainings and because I have very close friends who've done trainings and because I've read the handbooks on trainings. Um, I'm very familiar, for example, with the esoteric healing tradition uh, that came through Theosophy and Alice Bailey. Um, I'm very familiar with the healing trust strategies. I remember I read the manual first read the manual 25, 30 years ago, and I've looked at it again recently. I'm very familiar with Reiki. I haven't been initiated into Reiki, but people around me are masters who initiate people into Reiki 3. Um, I've also been involved in um, <clears throat> Eucharistic healings. That's some um, healing in, in churches where the priest um, does a laying on of hands and shamanic healings and soul retrieval and all that kind of stuff I've been very interested in, I've experienced it and I've, I've studied it without actually explicitly practicing it. Um, and I've, I have a model for what's going on that's a, ki that's a kind of um, scaffolding, a, ki a kind of template for the different things that are going on in a healing situation. And I want to share with you my template, my, my scaffolding for what, how I conceptualize what's going on with healing. And it guides how I think people actually do healing, because I think there are different types of healing. Um, so I kind of start with my um, definition of healing. Um, which is a kind of classic Taoist Chinese approach to health, which is that good health is comfortable flexibility. And that would be comfortable flexibility, not just in the body, but also in your emotions and the way you think and the way that you're in relationship with nature and the cosmos with nature, cosmos, and the great mystery of life. Call that God if you want to. So it's comfortably at ease and in flexible flow with it. And illness is uncomfortable and rigid. It's, it's not in flow, it, it's stuck. And that stuckness and lack of flow can be physical, and when it's stuck in the body, it's, it's a, a physical discomfort, physical pain, which, and the, the stuckness creates a friction, which creates inflammation and pain. And if emotionally and mentally we're stuck and rigid, um, then equally it creates emotional blockages and mental blockages which are unhealthy for us, and we go into various kinds of personality challenges, and mental health challenges, and you know what I'm talking about. And then there's a, another set of flow, harm, harmonized relationships, which are with nature and the cosmos and out and in to God, Goddess, Source, whatever, whatever you call it. And, and it's a flow. Um, and it's particularly interesting with the spiritual one, that the big one, that if, it's, that if it's not a flow and cosmic and oceanic, then people... Um, get stuck in a, a, what I would call fundamentalism, an illness, you know, where, where people are caught in a one particular belief about how the relationship and how they interpret the relationship with 
with, with goddess, God is, and there's a stuckness there which can lead to all kinds of personal and social problems. We know that. So, you can see I've done my prep. This is very old fashioned. Here we are on Zoom and I'm, use, I'm using flip charts. Um, so, just to say, we, looked, um, we, we know that um, this session is being recorded, so I'm assuming you'll get access to it. Um, I'm also going to write a, a blog article about what I'm sharing here. Um, and if you want that blog article, <clears throat> williambloom.com, sign up for my e-letter and I'll ping it to you. Williambloom.com, sign up for my e-letter and you'll get the blog article that, about, about this stuff that I'm sharing with you now. So when I'm thinking about healing, when I'm looking at someone who is experiencing illness, when I'm looking at myself when I'm not well, when I'm ill, I'm kind of looking to see, okay, am I in harmony and flow? Because if, if health is flexibility, comfortable flexibility, am I in harmony and flow, am I in comfortable flexibility with cosmos, with, the, with nature, with God, with source? Inside myself, am I in flow with my own spirit, my own soul? Um, and that, 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 that is a very big one to unpack, isn't it? Because my soul, my spirit, may have a different harmonic seeking to play out in my life than my little personality who wants um, to eat eclairs and have a ride on his motorbike, you know. My, my soul may have a different texture that it wants to have come through me. Um, I mean, if, and if there's a, a conflict between the texture of how my soul seeks to manifest, what its dharma what its purpose is for this incarnation, if, if there's a conflict between that and my um, habits, my addictions, my personality drives, you know, there'll be a conflict, a friction, and that friction will manifest in some kind of psychological, mental, emotional, or physical discomfort and lack of flexibility, which will then develop into an illness. And I also, in terms of where I'm looking for flow, I'm also, the way I think about it, I go right into the um, <clears throat> atomic and cellular nature of our bodies. Um, so, for example, you know, if, if I cut my hand, if there's a cut, then... It hurts, <laughs> and there's blood, and it needs fixing at, at, a, at a physical level. The, you know, the tissue needs to be joined back together, and, and there needs to be medical inter-healing that allows my cut hand to come back into comfortable flexibility. And... At a cellular level, let's, let's take um, heart disease or cancer. We know at a cellular level, if we go into the cells of the heart or the cells of the arteries or the cells of where the cancer is manifesting, we know that we will find individual cells that are inflamed, um, pathological, doing things that are not comfortable and in flow, but doing things that are uncomfortable and out of flow. Right? The, so so when, we're, when I'm thinking of healing, conceptualizing it or feeling into what I need or a friend needs, I'm, I'm kind of in a kind of, like, like open radar, just going, what is going on here? Is, is this, they need, are they out of flow with source and nature and cosmos? Are they out of flow within themselves? Are they out of flow at a, at a very 
immediate level in their bodies. Um, because obviously a, a cut in the hand, you know, is, is not, has not got the same um, dynamics behind it as um, if you develop a heart condition because of stress, where it's actual behavior and psychological dynamics. And I was very influenced in this by um, the teachings of um, Joao Ku, a Tibetan master who writes through Alice Bailey, who wrote a book called Esoteric Healing. If, if, um, if you want to dive deep into healing, I think Esoteric Healing by Alice Bailey is, it's like PhD level reading. It's not an easy read, but it's uh, six or seven hundred pages that go deep. And one of the things that he says there, when you're looking at um, illness, is he, say, he says, yeah, yeah, loads and loads of it, of course, is to do with personal behavior and personal dharma and personal interactions between you and your soul and what's going wrong and all the rest of that. But he also reminds us that our, our physical bodies are made up of stuff that belongs to the earth. And earth itself, Gaia itself, is not 100% pure. You know, it has pockets of, um, let's say, sulfuric acid. You know, it has pockets of um, radiatory materials that are uncomfortable for the body. You know? um, so you need to remember that built into the structure of the physical vehicle is the, um, how should we put it, the, the karma of Gaia herself. So possible imperfections are built into our vehicle. And it's very important, I think, to know that because it means that you don't, we, we um, don't get caught in that um, ideology that everybody creates their own illness. Um, we don't all create our own illness. We are part of a collective. We're part of tribes. We're part of DNA groups. We're part of constellations. And we're also part of the Earth. And Earth herself is not 100% pure by the very nature of the karma of the cosmos and built-in impurities. And we all know that uh, <laughs> the DNA of our ancestors and the messages carried on that DNA is not 100% pure. And we all know that the tribes we belong to are not 100% pure. So, so as individuals, we are carrying collective karma collective stuff that can become ill. And yeah, we may create the circumstances where that illness arises, but we need to remember that some of those illnesses sit there in the background. And I, I like that approach because it makes us much more humane to each other. Because if there's one thing that drives me bananas, is it's, it's the, you created your own illness, what's the lesson? as opposed to, well, let's, let's be present and loving to what's going on and unpack it. But this immediate kind of clever dick, uh, oh, what's that all about? What did you, you know, what's, what's that illness teaching you? you know, we all know that every illness contains huge lessons for us, but that's not why the illness is necessarily there, you know. And it's, uh, so I, I like this other angle on the <clears throat> we're part of collective karma because it makes it much easier for us to be compassionate and humane. So, I'm going to suggest to you, in this context, uh, and this is probably the one that some of you may go, oh, I don't know about this, um, let, let's see how you feel about it. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that in actual fact there are, for, for my model, just here, that, that there are three core types of doing healing. When we elect, choose to be a healer in a situation, if we go into a situation as a healer, whatever that situation is, I, th I think there are three things that a lot of us do 
instinctively and some of us are trained in it as well. Um, I think a lot of us are trained in the first and the second one I'll, that I've got up there on the board and I'll unpack them for you in a minute. I think the third one, there's less training in, but people do do it instinctively. So, if we accept a model of illness is uncomfortable rigidity, i.e. the stuff is not able to flow, stuff is not in a harmonic, right? Then what can be very helpful for someone is if we, as healers, come in and, I'm not sure I'm going to use the right words here, uh, allow a flow or pump in some good energy that moves. And as we pump in or allow to flow into the situation some good energy which moves, and it's not just a movement that's um, kind of directional from here to there, it's, it's en energy sp spins and vibrates. So when something is stuck, you don't just push it you come into it with an energy that's got a vibration, a slightly higher vibration maybe is one way of describing it, and that higher vibration goes into it and gets it moving as well. This, this is the beginning of a dance, obviously. This is, um... <clears throat> you, you get what I'm saying? So the energy is coming in, the flow of energy is coming in, but it's not just pushing, it has a vibration to it and a spin to it, and as it goes, and it's, this is multidimensional and metaphysical, and as it goes into the stuck stuff, wherever it is stuck, it triggers it, or through resonance, through joining with it, brings it to, into a place where it can move and vibrate at a better rate and come, come back into a state of health, come back into a state of flow. And what I hope, you can see from that approach that this would apply not just to physical healing, where stuff is stuck in the body, you know, where there's arthritis, for example, and arthritis, where there's an inflammation that is stopping, that makes painful inflexibility. So you, you put good energy into the tissue, and the tissue, which, which tissue kind of, it, it's like ice melting. The tissue melts and then comes back into flow. If you're going to have a success with arthritis, for example, or rheumatism or, or inflammation, that's what you're looking for, is the, is the, the frigid uh, stuff which has become granular and solid and not movement is grating against itself, which creates the inflammation, which creates the pain. So you want to get in there and open it up, it vibrates slightly higher, faster, it gets, comes back into flow. So you can see how that works at a physical level. Equally, <clears throat> when someone is emotionally stuck in whatever it is, you know, I want whatever it is, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want, you know, or, or I want it to be, you know, this, this would probably be, uh, this is mainstream Buddhist teaching, desire, desire is the source of all suffering. You know, and, and for definite, emotionally, psychologically, wanting stuff and not getting it c creates suffering, creates pain. So, so you come in as a friend, as a parent, as a colleague, as a, a lover, as a healer, and your own attitude and way of communicating with the person and your energy and attitude can help shift it, can help move it on, can help the person release themselves from that stuckness. And equally, in, at a higher spiritual level, um, you know, the, one of the um, <laughs> when I go, oh, that means oh, just that's what I think, is it? Um, you know, that those of you who are teachers, you'll know that when you're actually teaching, you you clarify what you actually think. It sometimes you don't know what you're thinking until you say it. <laughs> um, one of the things that's been forgotten in spiritual counselling, I think over the last 20-30 years, is the fact that, that there's a tradition in spiritual support, 
giving spiritual support to people, doing proper spiritual direction, which used to happen in monasteries and convents and in religious orders. That, yes, at one level you're going, oh, bless, what's going on? Let's soothe the trauma or allow the trauma to express and we can heal it. And at another level, um, spiritual directors sometimes, in a bullying way, so I don't, I don't want that coming in here, would just go, you need a kick up the ass, man. Kick it on with it. Do it. More prayer. More fasting. Or just more surrender to love. Just get off your own story. You're too wrapped up in yourself. You know, all you're doing is whinging about your family and whinging about what your illness is, blah, blah, blah. And actually, enough, enough already. Get off it. Align with spirit. Do your practice. You know, a bit of discipline. Just to get, just get on with it. And it, that's a very um, counterintuitive message, isn't it, in, in our current culture where, where people there's so much conversation about trauma and care for trauma. But there are times when it's absolutely appropriate that we give people a, a, a push. Yeah, you know, shift, change, just in the same way as we push prana into them. That creates a spin and a vibration. I think there's a second form of healing, and often, you know, good practitioners of the first kind, like laying on of hands, doing energy healing, should also be practitioners of the second one. The second kind of healing is simply that You are a grounded, embodied, calm, loving presence. And just by being with the person, your vibration communicates to them and their body empathically picks up where you're at and goes into a similar resonance. So if someone is experiencing um, the emotional rigidity of fear, which then translates into physical anxiety and tension, and that you are a presence that's embodied loving and calm, that communicates to the other person, both as a radiation, as a body language that can be perceived and what's called social contagion, you kind of imitate what's going on. And at a more um, occult level, the um, cells that are alive in the other person's body come into relationship with the cells in your body, and you are chilled, in a kind of loving space, and the cells in the other person's body go, oh, that, that feels nice, maybe we should do the same. And there's a little relationship going on at a softer level. And I think um, nearly everybody who's caring and who finds themselves caring for a loved one or someone vulnerable in distress goes into that second mode of healing. Um, I think the energy of it is ramped up, if they also have spiritual practice and are connected with spirit. If you're connected with spirit and you're just a calm, benevolent presence, I think there's an amplification of what's useful for the other person. So those are the two versions of healing. One is, whoosh, let's wash some prana and some yang energy into it. Second one is, I'm just a loving presence. And, and I, th you know, I think a lot of the... Um, skeptical medical establishment that um, is hostile to spiritual healing and Reiki, what they do recognize is that somebody's loving presence, caring presence, is in itself palliative and healing for someone. Um, so quite often that's a two-edged sword because it means when there, when there are um, academic uh, research studies going on on the usefulness of Reiki or spiritual healing, there, there will be one bunch of um, 
medical skeptics saying, yeah, but what the, the reaction you're getting from the patient is simply because the person is kind. They're hanging out with somebody kind for half an hour. And the other 23 and a half hours of their life is not filled with someone who's kind. So it's an interesting double side to it. But for us, I would, I would want us doing both the prana healing and just being a kind, loving presence. There's a third kind of healing, um, which I think some people practice instinctively. And I'm not sure whether there's anybody training in it at the moment uh, in the UK or the States. There may be some training somewhere. Um, the two um, arenas where I met it were in, the first was in um, healing people who had been damaged from taking overdoses of LSD. And the second arena was um, in women's groups that my partner Sabrina was part of, where they did a ceremony called Reconsecration of the Womb. Um, in these two models, um, the, the underlying practice and theory was similar. I'll, I'll start with the LSD model, first of all. Um, in the LSD model, the, what happened to someone who overdosed on LSD was they went into a state very similar to what would be classically diagnosed as psychosis. Um, they couldn't distinguish um, reality from unreality, hallucinations, strange thoughts, strange voices, and all the rest of it. From an esoteric perspective, what was happening was that the brain, this was an, an anatomy that I was taught, that the brain has etheric webbing, has etheric webbing, that's like prana that's interwoven to make a web, has etheric webbing that separates different parts of the brain in order to separate out what the brain picks up and processes. So, you know, the model for this is consciousness is not generated by the brain. Consciousness is part of our energy field and aura, and the brain processes it in exactly the same way as, as a television processes the signals that are coming from, from the broadcasting stations. You know, what, what you're seeing like right this moment, I'm not inside your computer. I'm I'm somewhere else, but I've been broadcast to you. And the brain the brain is similar. The consciousness does does not get created by the brain. The brain is a receptor and a processor of events happening in the field, in the consciousness field. So when somebody takes LSD too intensely or inappropriately, and I absolutely support anybody who goes, no, I'm not going anywhere near it, because I have a, an intuition that would, it would totally screw me up, yes. Um, but if people do take it, and a lot of people have good experiences, what can happen is the etheric webbing that protects various parts of the brain from other parts of the brain and other parts of the energy field, the etheric webbing opens up. And as the etheric webbing opens up, information flows in uncontrolled. So a healer working with someone who is experiencing um, that kind of post-LSD trauma, their job is to allow the web, the etheric web, to close back down. And the last thing that's going to close it back down is dynamic, Yang style prana and chi. That first type of healing that we were talking about where you get things spinning and moving. Because if you put in that kind of prana into that kind of wound, so to speak, etheric wound, it will just stimulate it and keep it open. In my opinion, in my experience, there may be some of you who have more experience of this than me and can um, correct me 
on it. I, I would, well, whoops, I'd welcome that. Similar to that, people who have experienced sexual abuse will experience that the um, etheric webbing that normally is contained and closed, the etheric webbing when people experience sexual abuse, etheric webbing is kind of torn through because of the intrusion and the abuse. So following that kind of horrible incident, rape, the person is dealing with the psychological issues of the abuse and the psychological trauma and physical bruising, but also the etheric webbing that normally um, surrounds and protects the sacral area, the genetic area, that has been torn open. In, as I understand it, in um, consensual lovemaking between adults who know what they're doing, there's a consensus and you voluntarily open to the other person. And then afterwards, it just naturally closes down. And this is part of what would be part of good tantric teaching. Yeah. Opening, closing, as a result of rape, it's torn. So in this particular uh, form of healing, the person who has endured the rape, the form of healing that takes place is one in which obviously you, you're, you're reassuring and loving and present to them, loving, a loving presence second one but and it's very difficult to describe this but I'm, sh I'm sure you'll get this intuitively is you hold them so as to allow the etheric pranic web to drop back into a healthy state you hold it so it drops down and develops and grows again it's not dissimilar from those of you who do cranial sacral where you're holding the person's head and you're not directly pushing any energy up and down the back, you're allowing it to drop into what should be a healthy state. It's an, it's an allowing for it to drop into a healthy state. And, and I think it's similar to when we're with someone who's in deep distress and um, we know we, we're going to stay with them until they come out of the distress. And it's not just that you're there as a loving presence. There's something going on in our psyches which says, just, just drop back into what feels safe. You know, that, that, that do as much sobbing as you need to do. Or shaking or whatever it, or whatever it is that will release the trauma, the history, but just allow yourself to drop down back into place. And that's a subtle form of healing. Um, and my experience though is with mature healers, uh, practitioners who, who are empathic and loving and sensitive, they immediately, intuitively understand what I'm talking about. And um, I don't know of any training that's going on. And I think if I were counselling, supervising someone wanting to do this type of healing, I would say follow your intuition. If you already know about being a benevolent presence, then just follow your intuition. Because you can't, it's not intrusive. There's no harm you can do in simply holding someone and allowing it to drop into place. So those are three
types of healing as, as in terms of how I conceptualize it. Now I'm going to bring in the angelic stuff now. Um, Okay, are you ready for a shift? Um, if we were in a room together, I'd probably, just, just, why don't we just give ourselves one minute stretch? Just because I, I feel like I need to stretch. We've been at this now for 45 minutes in the room. So just, just join me for a minute and just, just give yourself a little stretch. It, it will just help us all uh, shift gears as we go into the last stage of you can't see me you just see my body all right it's a little bit better okay so um here's the last bit um Some of you know that I've been working consciously with the David angelic realm since my early 20s. Um, so let me, let me I'll, I'll share what I think purely in an esoteric fashion without any stories, without any of my background. Um, from a, an occult, metaphysical, esoteric perspective, um, Everything that exists has um, an energetic, etheric, pranic template th that is part of it. So, for example, if, if I say to you, um, the, imagine a tree, imagine the physical tree disappears, but imagine the spirit of the tree is still there. You go, okay, got it, there's, there's the presence of the tree, but the actual tree is not there. Or if I say the same thing about a mountain, oh, there's a mountain, but the mountain's not there. Oh, there's the presence of the mountain. The, pre the mountain has a presence. Um, or a river. Or a human being. There's a presence there, even aside from the physicality of the person. So from a metaphysical perspective, <clears throat> the universe is interwoven with this other parallel dimension. And just as our dimension, physical dimension, has mineral, plant, animal, human as a flow, so there's an equal flow in the metaphysical, angelic, or devic, which is the kind of Hindu word for it, the kind of devic dimension. I don't want to go off on a um, tangent talking too much about the esoterics of angels, but here's, here's, the, here's the thing to get. Um, the devas, the angelic realm, holds in its energy field the pattern for how something can be. A deva hold in its energy field the pattern for how something can be. So the deva of a tree holds in its energy field the pattern for how that tree can grow. The deva of a blade of grass holds a pattern for how that blade of grass can be. The devas of Education, for example, you may not have thought about this, but the angels that overlight schools, they have in their field a pattern for how good education happens. Good education is creative, expansive, knowledge, new experience. The angel... There's an exercise I often do in workshops where I say to people, tell, tell us what you think the perfect home is like. 
and people come up with a list of stuff. And that list applies to Buckingham Palace, down to a, a hut, to a caravan, to a bed sitter. Everybody knows what the perfect home is like. It, it's um, safe, comfortable, nurturing. You're able to sleep in it. If, you know, it's, there's certain elements to it, and, and there's, there's a archetypal sense of what the perfect home is like, which, which a rabbit warren or a bird's nest has too. Right? So there's an angel of what the perfect home is like. So there are angels of healing. And it would be a much, we'd need to do a whole series of talks on where do they come from, how did they become angels of healing and all that kind of stuff, right? But there are angels of healing. And if you are a healer of any kind, a therapist of any kind, you'll know that when you're with a client, you have a sense of where to go with it. There's a, there's a moment where you're kind of pausing and going, going, Okay, I have a practice that I use normally. Is this, okay, I'm going to do it now. Okay, I'm just going to. And there's a kind of threshold you pass through to get into a flow of what's happening and where you think your client should be and go. And talk therapists experience this all the time. I'm not sure what to say. I'll say this, and I'm going there. And body therapists, people who do massage, know full well that before you touch the body, you attune to the body and then you go, okay, I'll come in here. And then you have a sense of where to go next. You do what's called chasing the dragon, chase, chasing the knots, chasing the uncomfortable rigidity. You go in to chase the uncomfortable rigidity. You meet the uncomfortable rigidity like in muscle frozen tissue, at which point it's, oh, how, how am I going to move it? Is this going to be deep push massage or is it going to be soft, softer? Am I going to try and open up and yield around it to let it relax back into it. And I would suggest to you that if you are in a situation where you do healing quite often, whether you recognize it or not, there will be healing angels or a healing angel with you that holds the template of what the perfect healing will be like, even if the perfect healing doesn't happen. So like the angel of the tree holds the template for the perfect tree, but there may be a hurricane or there may be a drought. And when we're doing healing with someone, we have a sense of what the perfect healing will be like. And that's what we're going for. And hopefully it fulfills and consummates may not do, but we have a sense of the perfect healing before we actually get there. We're being magnetically attracted to a consummation, a perfect, a perfect ending. And the suggestion here is that it's the healing angel that holds that sense of how the healing will be complete. At the same time, as, a, as an empathic, sensitive healer, we will also be aware of, in the person, the relationship between the person and their soul, what their soul is trying to incarnate with, the kind of patterns that are going on there. And we may also have a sense of, okay, I need to move some energy or start a conversation that will help that integration happen. So there's not just the, the healing angel, there's also our own relationship with the inner dynamic of the person you're with and the resistance or rigidities in the physicality and psychology of the person. So quite, it's quite a constellation, a rainbow of stuff, isn't it? But we are complex beings, we're Shakespearean beings, we're not simple. Any healing model that tries to suggest that human beings are simple is, is missing out on the, 
extraordinary complexity of our, our, our genius and our shadow, you know, and all the dynamics that are at play there. And inside of all that, also at a physical level, the, the, the elementals, the cellular elementals that make up the body of the person we're with are also alive. And they're part of a template that would be a perfect body, that would be a perfect liver, that would be a perfect circulation, circulatory system. And we're in touch with that as well. So there's a whole, for a healer who's genuinely empathic and holistic, there's a whole set of relationships going on. I'm coming into the last five minutes now. But that's a lot of stuff to have to deal with. But you don't need to know the mechanics of it, in my opinion. What you do need to know, what I need to know, is the importance of pausing and being completely soft and at ease in order to catch an impression of what is most appropriate in the circumstances. So if as a healer you know before you do the healing that you pause and genuinely empty yourself as best you can. You know, genuinely just go, okay, and just allow yourself to open and feel, sense. And it's not, this is not an intellectual exercise. You don't think it through. You won't get pictures, or some of you may get pictures, but it's, 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 it's an intuitively felt thing. You go, okay, I kind of have a sense of what's going on here. And using these skills I have, and using the kind of person I am, I will now do whatever it is you do. But um, repeating myself, the crucial thing here is, is, is the pausing and the being very quiet and open like a radar dish. And just going, okay, there are various levels here. Where's the person at in relation to source and nature and the beauty of life? Where are they at in terms of their own soul's journey? What's going on at a cellular level? Just hold back. Do I need to be pushy? Do I need to be soft? Do I need to just be allowing and listen? You know, and then, okay, let's begin this journey together and see where it goes. You know, and you'll be adjusting as you go along, um, unless you're just doing straightforward, no, bit of healing like that, um, which is great, often really needed. Um, yeah. So there we are. I've been rabbiting on for almost an hour. Um, let's take a minute's quiet just before we go into um, looking at what's in the chat box, shall we? So just pause. And in the silence, just know that before you heal or give help to someone, that crucial importance of just pausing, grounding, opening, being fully present. And then using the skills and the character that you are intuitively, instinctively beginning your healing process. Okay, thank you. So, um, has anybody been monitoring me? Are there any juicy questions that have...
cropped up already. If, if there are, let me know. Otherwise, people, please um, put your questions into the chat box. Hello, thank you very much, William. That was lovely, wonderful. I'm just having a quick look. There were some questions that were coming in. Um, uh, to start with, about the, uh, the the tearing of the sacral area, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to go back. Yeah, so Jane has asked, when the etheric webbing is torn due to abuse, does the information go in uncontrolled like it would in the psychosis model? Um, this is a very poignant and sensitive topic, obviously. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, and it's something that I've, I've been in long conversations with um, women about, and some men who've been raped. Um, when the etheric webbing is torn there, I'm going to use a kind of graphic phrase, um, it's almost as if the etheric webbing is kind of flopping about a bit, and predators, male predators, bullying predators, can sense it. Just like bullying predators can sense weakness in somebody's body language. Or this, sexual predators can sense it, which is one of the reasons why women and men who've been abused may face serial abuse. Because it's so, and, and on top of that, um, this is the worst thing, <clears throat> Uh, is that they may be leaking sexual energy. So they've been abused and there's sexual energy leaking and people get the wrong chemical signals. So in terms of information, there's a, something very unfortunate happening for some victims of sexual abuse. Which, and it's one of the reasons why often talk, talking is not the issue. You, know, you can't talk it out. It, it needs real calm for, I mean, most people will at given time and safe space, it will safely close down. But you need time, you need, you need several years of being in a circumstance where you're completely safe and nobody's coming onto you sexually and, and, every, you know, and you maybe have a healthy partner who respects your boundaries. Um, it's a very sensitive subject. Um, and I, at the moment, I don't know any groups of women who are doing uh, this type of healing. But I think all of you who are listening to this, I think there's a di divine economy at work. I think you understand what I'm talking about and you can help someone you meet maybe close it down. Just have a, the, the, the trick here is not to put any prana in. Yes. Don't put any chi, flowing chi in. It's just to hold the web so that it drops back down into mm. its state of perfection. Yeah, it's very poignant. Mm. Mm, thank you. Um, and Carol has asked, the holding allows the shock and trauma of a forced sexual act to be expressed and what is broken in the person as a result of extreme shock come together. I can see that. Make sense? Yeah, yeah I, we're in a whole realm of understanding trauma as well here. So there are various layers which is working. But thank you very much for that comment. And there's, uh, Maxine has asked about, I'm wondering if the trauma of being gang stalked, I'm not sure what gang stalked means, yeah. whether it means gang raped, I don't know, also leads to this etheric web tearing. Most people have not heard of the psychological torture that is gang stalking. I know what you're talking about. Um, I, I'm, I'm just kind of just, I'm having a conversation with you now. I'm not saying for certain. My sense of it is there would need to be a physical intrusion in order for the webbing to be um, burnt open. That said, you know, if someone... If someone were already vulnerable, if someone were already vulnerable, then I can imagine that deeply exacerbating the situation. And, and 
I think people have no understanding of the um, injury done to um, women and people of color in racist and sexist societies from the little mini traumas that can happen all the way through the day. There's a, there's a build up of, of um, anxiety, fear, and um, yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of um, people are too cavalier about it. And I, th I think those, that's the, the build up of the mini traumas needs to be taken seriously. Thank you. Um, and Anne says, William, I agree about craniosacral therapy. It recognizes and respects that everyone has a blueprint for health, for their own health, and helps facilitate that. It's not imposing anything, so that I think that CST fits into your third category. I like the respect it shows to each person and their own homeostatic healing mechanism. Excellent. And Wendy says, thank you, William, generous and engaging. And Maxine says, thank you for a very thought provoking presentation. Um, Ali has said, during Healing Awareness Week, a lot has been said about spirit guides bringing about healing. You've talked about the individual healer. Do you see devas or angels as equivalent to spirit guides? Huh. Well, wow. this, this is the beginning of a lovely uh, metaphysical discussion, esoteric discussion. Um, in my map of metaphysical cosmology, which um, derives from um, a whole stream of teachings that kind of manifests in the West through Theosophy, Alice Bailey, uh, Steiner, Anthroposophy, Rosicrucianism, and my own experience, because um, I wouldn't have bought all that stuff if it didn't match my experience, because um, I was having my own take on it before I found those authors. But I have always gone, there are two streams of evolution. One is human, and one is angelic David, and they are very, very different. Very, very different. And, yeah, there are dead people floating around doing good, helpful things, and they're spirit guides. And there are angels floating around doing their thing as well, and they're separate. Now, at a practical level, um, maybe it doesn't matter when you're doing healing, whether you're being guided, helped by a spirit guide or by an angel. Because at the core of it, what I'm looking for in the people that I would be training or supervising or coaching or learning from, um, what I'm looking for is, okay, before and while I'm doing the healing, I have a sense of where it's going and how to do it. Now, I, how, where you get that sense from is kind of academic, isn't it? I, I, I happen to love esoterics and metaphysics. It's been part of my path, but it's not a necessary part of everybody's path. But the important bit for healers, the really important bit for healers is we have that sense of, okay, there's another dimension at work here what am I intuitively being drawn into doing? That, that would be, that's, that's my get out of jail card for that question. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, Rebecca says, Re Rebecca's one of our trustees in the Healing Trust. Uh, so glad I managed to hear some of this, William. Always poignant, deeply insightful and sincere. Thank you. And Gillian says, would you say that healing takes place through the healer rather than of the healer? In other words, the healer attunes, stands back in simplicity, follows inspirational guidance, 
and the healing takes place in simplicity. Yes, and. So, yeah, absolutely. What you've just described is a core skill required by every healer. And we are also creative beings. And we are in training to be initiates, adepts, liberated beings. And we don't just act as channels for energy. We also generate mood, energy ourselves. So there's a relationship there. And for me, I would like a mature healer to be comfortable with both. Um, Because we both know the shadow sides, the the negative sides of being too much of one or too much. Too much of one, if you say it's all just God channeling through me, it's none of of my business, it it can lead to um, a form of arrogance, a lack of responsibility and dissociation, right? I mean, this is worse. I'm talking about its worst shadow sides. Where, and equally, the person who thinks they're generating the healing can equally, equally become completely egocentric and swanky and showing off, right? So at the core of it, we always need to be humble, but not over humble but, and creative because we're learning, aren't we? You know, but I do think what you said is absolutely right as a foundation. You have to be able to be in that role of just uh, an instrument of thy peace. An instrument of thy peace, but I'm also a human being, and I'm involved creatively here. Well, you, know, you know, maybe I should buy them some chocolate as well. <laughs> or maybe you know, because because there's a divine economy that's put that person with you, yes. or has put you with that person. You know, which is why I was very careful in the um, when I led the little guided exercise, which was when you had when you're attuned to what to do next, you attune to what you do next in relation to your skill set and what is authentic to you. And what is authentic to you will will depend on your character type. You know, for example, in my case, please, I have the skills for knowing how to just be a silent instrument of peace. I have those skills, but that's not my character. My my character is is I, I like to teach. I like to teach, I like to coach, I like to write, I'm a creative. That's my character. So if someone comes to me for support, yes, I'll drop into I'm an instrument of thy peace, you know, humble little squidget, but they're with me and this is what I, I have my own thing to give to the situation. Not always, but sometimes. And I think you, it's good for you to be authentic to who you actually are. It's like Jennifer. I, Jennifer, I, it's like Jennifer. I would want Jennifer to sing to me. <laughs> She's a wonderful singer. You know? So if Jennifer gave me a healing, I might well say, "Go on, sing us a song as well." Because you know? I would I just. I have been known to do that. Yeah, I bet you. Because it just would mag- make it magic. I mean, think of healers I know who are great harp players. You know, mm. like they how wonderful to say, "Go on, play a harp as well," right? And I equally, I'm thinking of one person in particular who just is is wonderful healing presence. And then when it comes to giving advice, this person is just incredibly rude and direct. But that's perfect sometimes, isn't it? Well, you just need to be told, you know? So if I go to that person for healing, I will, and I will go. Give me some feedback. What do I, you know? What what am I, what am I missing? You know, and it will be eh, as, and that's a hundred percent different from someone who's trained in Rogerian person-centered counselling. You know, where you just hold space and allow your service client to just grow in their own way. You know, there are, there are different character types, and I'd like you. I like people to honour who they are, sure. and afterwards. 
afterwards have a reflective practice in which they go, okay, was that useful, not useful? You know, did that serve, not serve? Where's my growth now? You know. mm. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, and Maxine uh, wants to say that the fact that you have heard of gang stalking means a lot to me. Yeah, it's thank horrible. Mm, I'm sure, yes. But it, it's group bullying, it's... it's really... Um, you, okay, you know so where, you, you know, because you know where I met gang stalking first. I went to a private boys' school, uh, and and it was ritualized in the prep schools. It was ritualized that there would be that kind of stalking, and then and it would end with a pounce mm, and okay. a beating up. Yeah. Okay, Jess says, really insightful information on this presentation, thank you. I'd be interested to know how would you suggest one goes about healing their sacral chakra with their own work? Understanding going to a healer would also be beneficial. My suggestion, Jess, is lying in bed before you go to sleep, Tune in to what we've been talking about, this whole notion of the etheric webbing, and just talk to your body, talk to that sacral area, and just say, while I'm sleeping, close down, close down, rework the web, and just, and just allow it to be very soft as you drop into sleep. And um, it would take some time maybe a few months, but do it softly. Do it softly and patiently. Thank you. Um, and then Anne has, has uh, something to share. My sense when healing is the angels seem to hold the space. The guides help me place my hands if needed. Thank you, great talk. That's a lovely sharing, Anne, thank you. And Steve, lovely Steve is here. Um, is the diagnosis of schizophrenia similar to LSD damage and need a similar approach? Steve, I don't know. I don't know because I, I it'd be part of a longer conversation, wouldn't it? I, I imagine in some situations, yes, but in other situations, the bruising and the trauma that has led to the presentation of psychosis may have a genetic history, may have a karmic history, or, or may be the result of social circumstances that that person has been enduring for decades. And um, I would... I'm in conversation with a couple of psychiatrists actually about this kind of thing. And at this stage, and I, would say, I don't know. Yeah, good. Well, good to be truthful, always. Um, so Anne says, for Jess and healing her sacral chakra, would it help to ask her inner child what she needs? Um, that's a really... Interesting question, Anne. Um, I tell you what I think, and this is me shooting from the hip. Um, and if, if if we had a longer time, it might be a different conversation. Mm. I think for something like this, where you know there's been an intrusion that needs healing, you want to put the story to the side, um, and you just want to go for let the webbing relax back into its proper tone. And I would be concerned that uh, an inner dialogue would actually distract from that soft healing and would be very useful in other circumstances or maybe later on. But in the first place, we're just dealing with, with the existential reality of the tear. Yeah. that needs to come back into place. And it's one of those things that I would say, and I really appreciate talk therapy and inner dialogue, it's one of the situations where I'd say,
put the narrative to the side for the moment and just trust a very deep etheric process to happen. And it might be wrong, and I, you know, we would explore, you'd explore this in person, wouldn't you, with the person you're talking with? So I've just, mm, give, I've cool. just, I've just given you an opinion based on a, a situation I don't really know about, so maybe I should have mm. not given an opinion <laughs> at all. Okay. Um, and Victoria has said, thank you, William, for your sharing, for sharing your experiences, insights and knowledge in a warm and down-to-earth way. I found it informative and it's been greatly appreciated. She has just put another question. Wonder about generational trauma and webbing injuries. How best to offer healing? Question mark. Can wounds be handed down in terms of either, I think that says, uh, I can't quite understand that. Yeah. Um, in terms of either, if trauma in this way, if the trauma isn't in that way. That makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm, in, in my experience, if birth is healthy, if infant is healthy, then the etheric webbing the construct will be intact mm. and you don't bring over into a new life that kind of tearing. Okay. Not that kind of tearing. The problems will be carried over at a different level. Okay. But not that, not, not that particular level. We're getting quite technical now, aren't we? Yes, aren't we? And yes. I think actually that is probably the last... Okay. Yeah. It is the last question that we've got, and I think we're running out of time a bit now. Yeah. But thank yous to everyone for putting your questions, and thank you, William, for uh, answering them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Gillian just says thank you for your answer. So insightful, with complete balance and very open. It was all so acceptable with depth and understanding. Oh. Thank you. So that's brilliant. So thank you so much, William. Uh, for those I don't think I said earlier that I'm Jennifer Jones and I'm chair of the Healing Trust and the lovely William Bloom, who is our patron, uh, has joined us today and given us this lovely, lovely, lovely talk. Really, really interesting. Always, William. Oh, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for coming. And I think we're going to close down and get out into the sunshine. Yes. If there is still sunlight. So, so, Recording ev stopped. Everybody, lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. Lots of love to all of you. Thank you, William. Thank you. See you soon. Yeah, bye. Bye. Mm. Oh, gosh. This... It's ten more questions have come in. Oh, they're just, they're not questions, they're... Thank you. Oh, that's nice. Pe yes. People can still hear us, which is lovely. Still yeah. hanging around, have a cup of tea together. Let's see if this was if this were in person, wouldn't it? We'd all go off and have a cup of tea together. <laughs> we would. Yeah. Well, that's what we often do on these things. Yeah. We sit around and have a cup of tea. All right. Well, I'm going to drop off the call. Lots of love, everybody. All right. Thank you so much, William. Lovely yeah. to see you. Bye. Take care.